Hello, I'm Charles Gatlin. Welcome to the Church in Action podcast. Uh, we know that when the people of God do the work of God, loving our neighbors in unity, people want to know Jesus Christ. And that transforms their lives, communities, New England, and the world. And so we, on our podcast, talk about the ingredients that makes that happen, making disciples who do justice and share Jesus to accelerate evangelism. Today, we're talking about sharing Jesus, because when we're living like disciples, disadvantage ourselves to serve others, people want to know Jesus, and then we need to be ready to share the gospel effectively in a winsome, loving, truthful way. And so today, we've got a, a great guest. I think you're going to love Pastor Cindy Cabral of Livingstone Christian Center uh, and down in Brockton, Mass. I shouldn't say down. Not everybody's where I am. So for some of you, it's up in Brockton. Some of you, it's down in Brockton. Others, it's over in Brockton. <laughs> I, I think you're going to love Pastor Cindy. She's just got such a great heart. We have a lot of fun together. We're on a call every Tuesday uh, with some other pastors, and it's just a great time each week uh, of learning. Pastor Cindy, thanks for being with us. I appreciate you. Thank you for inviting me. Can, can just to get started, can you share a little bit about your background with folks, just so they get to know you? Where, where are you from? How did you wind up in ministry? How did you meet Jesus? Those kinds of things. Um, well, I single mother, single young mother, raised by a single young mother. Um, and my grandmother, uh, we were, I was born in Alabama and my grandmother moved to Boston so that my mother could um, have more opportunities as far as jobs. And so that's how we ended up in Boston. Um, and I left Massachusetts for a while and came back. And then in 1988, I was introduced to Christ. And um, yeah. And so when you moved up from Alabama, were you a little kid at that time? I was, you... I was about, well, my mother, <laughs> I was a bad child. <laughs> unlike, unlike the rest of us who were just unlike alike. the rest of you guys. I, uh, yeah. So my mother had eight children and um, I was the oldest and um, she decided to send me to Tennessee to stay with my uncle and my auntie because she just couldn't handle. I was very rebellious. So she just couldn't handle um, trying to make a new start and to deal with me and my stuff all at the same time. And so, um, I came to, um, Massachusetts. I was about 12. Okay. Yeah. When I was 12. And where, where, in, where in Tennessee, just out of curiosity, Knoxville, Knoxville, okay. Tennessee, Knoxville, okay. Tennessee. Enough country music down there for you? Uh, yes. But, I, you know, the <laughs> thing is, I love music. I love all kind of music. So, yeah. Okay. But uh, coming up, when I stayed with my uncle and my auntie, talking about being rebellious, the only thing we could play was uh, Christian music because they were very into the church. And, um, and uh, my uncle would always sit me down and we had to recite like during the thunderstorms when everything had to be quiet, no TVs, no anything. Um, we had to recite uh, John 14 all of the time, all the time. And I just never knew what impact some of this was gonna end up having on me. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And John 14, the whole chapter? No, not John, the whole chapter. Or I should, I probably should say John three, John three. I'm probably off a little bit here. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but the, but the whole chapter. The whole chapter, because you know, down south in Alabama, especially um, with the ages that my uncle and aunties were, is like when it thundered and stormed, everything had to go off. All electricity, you know, not allowed to move. The only thing you can have is, but the only thing that you were allowed to read was the Bible. And so that's. And can, can you still recite John three? Uh, I knew you was going to do that. I'm not going to ask you to, so you can say <laughs> yes, and nobody's going to know. But God, oh, well, yes, <laughs> I really can. I just, I, I, you know, I just have to sort of start because once I get started, I just go through the whole thing uh, oh. as I, as if I was still sitting uh, at his leg. Yeah. Wow, that's that's cool. I've tried. I. You know, verses are about as good as I can do, and it's so hard to learn anything now. Um, but I'm so impressed by people who do chapters and books. But and I and I, you know, and as a pastor, you would think that I would be able to retain all of these scriptures, and I can't. 
you know, um, and the older I get, the harder it's becoming. But I, I praise God for the Holy Spirit, for him bringing the scripture back to you when you need it. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I, I lean heavily on and the, the, one of the New Testament writers says somewhere in scripture, it says, and I rely on that. If that was good enough for a New Testament writer, that's good enough for me, because I don't always remember exactly where it is, too. And so now when you can, when you when so when your grandmother first moved up, did you guys move to Brockton or did you move someplace? else? We moved to Roxbury, actually. OK. And so then how did you come to Brockton or how, and maybe it was the call to ministry, but. Uh, so the thing is, is that um, I used to belong to a church here in Boston, uh, the church split and the pastor, um, the founder of Lively Stones Christian Center, that um, pastor, uh, he was out um, in Abington and so he founded a church in Abington. We we did um, uh, local bars and, and hotels and all of those things for a while. And then we um, um, established the church in Abington, Mass. And when he passed, when the founder, when the founder passed, I found myself um, becoming um, the pastor. Um, I decided I wanted to do Brockton because as I would drive through Brockton as a bowler, you know, you go through Brockton all the time. But um, and I would look at the young people and the young people all seemed dead, like there was just nothing to do. And so that's what the Lord gave me. Um, Brockton is where we need to be. So and while you were attending the church before you became a pastor, were you in ministry in some way there? or were you, um, in- I've, you know, since I've gotten saved, I'm not a pew sitter. I, you know, if I see something in the church that need to be done, I wouldn't ask. I would just go start doing it. And so both of my, the pastors that I were under have always seen that. So I've, I've clerked. Um, I've, um, I was the clerk. I was in the choir. I was choir director, youth leader, Sunday school teacher, you know, um, clean the church, make a table, do whatever I had to do in order for uh, the ministry to go forward. As a matter of fact, fact, I think what started me was as a youth leader, um, I had a lot of teens. And so uh, I had about 30 kids and I would teach them Christian education class, but I would meet with them every Friday. And it would amaze me that these kids and and a couple of them were my nephew, one of them was my nephew, would always want to come and sit with me and hear what I had to say. <laughs> it just blew my mind. But uh, yeah, and then some of them are now, and what makes me proud of that is some of them are now first ladies in churches. Um, some of them are still um, seeking God and, you know, doing ministry. So um, that seed I was thankful for. Yeah. yeah, that's a great legacy. And so, so you move the church to Brockton. And so now how, when did you become the pastor? Yes. When was that? So my, 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 the founder had um, passed away uh, the day before my birthday and um, he had left um, a list of things with his wife. And one of those was that he wanted me to become pastor of Lively Stones Christian Center. And I was shocked because I just became a reverend the year before. No, no formal training, you know, just watching and doing. Um, and so I became pastor and the, the members that were left wanted me to be pastor. And someone said, well, yeah, you got that um, um, not not on your own, but just because. And I said, no, it was because God, because if God did not want me to be pastor, regardless of what he put on a piece of paper, I still would not be pastor. So anyway, so that's how I became pastor. And I've only been doing it three years. Three years. So you, so you came in a year and a half ish before COVID. Yes. Right. So you got a year and a half of normal church, if we can call it that. And then you had a year. But and a half we wasn't before. normal because we we, we were wandering. <laughs> Because the church, the the we had a, a big, huge Catholic church that was in Abington, and it was at 127 North Quincy Street, the only church that was on that road. Um, but we only had a very small congregation because as the pastor got sick, people scattered. Yeah. 
And um, he decided the best thing to do um, when he realized how sick he was, was to sell the um, to sell the building because he wanted to make sure that his wife was taken care of and that the church could continue. Mm -hmm. So uh, we sold that building. So um, the July, um, the church doors closed and me now pastor having to figure out what we want to do. So it, mm -hmm. I think it was October that we decided to go into a hotel and start having services with whomever would come. Mm -hmm. And that's how we did it. Wow. And so, and so you, you did now you're in hotels and today though, you're in a church again. We're in, we're in a rental space, uh, um, 362 Montello street. Um, and we turned the bottom part into our church. Um, and that's where we, and, and we started, we was fixing it up and making plans about what we're going to do. And then COVID hit. Yeah. So. And then you didn't need that space anymore, even though you still have it, right? But you know, I was, you know, we still have it. We didn't have, we didn't need the space anymore, but I, I thank God for the space because it did allow us to continue to keep some of the things we had from the, from the church. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the landlord, was very gracious, um, actually. Um, and so we didn't have to pay lights and gas and all those things. And we just had to pay our rent. And I thank God for providing, um, that we were able to do that. Yeah. 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 And, and so what, so as you look back over the last three years, then what have you seen God doing, um, in Brockton, which is where your heart was called to, but in the church too? Well, what I'm what I'm beginning to see mostly is that the people that are under me are now growing and knowing that um, ministry is not the building that we're in. Ministry is the people that are outside the building. So how do we get out the word of God to the people that are outside the building? And so we began to. Um, pass out groceries on the street, not go into a, any kind of institution. So we pass groceries out on the street, book bags, different things like that. We try to do a, a community day, which just trying different things to, um, and then trying to connect with churches in Brockton is difficult, especially being a female pastor um, and a very small church. Um, and what I'm finding is that a lot of the pastors are, um, they're Haitian, Jamaican, Barbadian. So there is a cultural kind of gap there, but connecting with the mayor uh, of Brockton, cause he comes on with the pastors. I am the only female most times. Um, and trying to figure out how to get out into the community or to connect churches. And I'm finding that we as, we as churches, we are not connecting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's been a difficult, that's been difficult. And, and is it the kind of thing where you've tried to bring folks together and they uh, don't, or it just, right. Okay. So it just, it just doesn't work. It is not working. It, it's just not working. Um, and I, I don't know the reason why. And, mm -hmm. um, and what I'm seeking God for is just the next move of Lively Stones Christian Center. How can we get out to not connect with the churches, but just connect with the people that are not in the churches? And so now that's where my focus is shift. And it's, it's mostly shifted to um, because uh, based on demographics, there's a lot of mothers, single mothers with children. And I can speak to that because that's my background. I'm a, I was a single mother with a child. Yeah. So, yeah. And and so um, how do you think about evangelism? You're just talking about, um, you know, you need to get out to people. How do you think about it in your context? When, you, when you're out there, does it just naturally provide opportunities or do you have it to, does. is there a sensitivity we need to have or how, do, how does that well, work? Well, you know, I, what, I, what I've, our model at the church is um, one soul at a time, one soul at a time. We don't need to try to win thousands. We need to win one. Yeah. And if we can win one, 
I don't know what God will do with that one. And it's not about that one coming to Lively Stones Christian Center, but it is about that one going out to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's the mindset of uh, the people that God has placed me over because that's my mindset. That's what I drill down all the time. We're trying one soul at a time. So, um, if we did a big community day and we did a big community day, not a lot of people came, but one person mm -hmm. got the flyer and came and said that they would be back and that they uh, wanted to um, see what it was all about. But the, the church gave the love of Jesus Christ to that one person. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a su successful. Yeah, you know, you're you're reminding me. There's one church that uh, uh, up near where we live uh, that has something they could, and they're always focused on. They call it pray for one. Yes. And so, who's the one person you're praying for? Because some of us, you know, want to pray for the whole world. No. And then that means we don't have to do anything sometimes. That's so right. But That's now there's nothing right. I, have to do. I prayed for the world. I'm done. Versus, no, if you've been praying for the one, God at some point is going to open the right door, have the right well, conversation. That's right. And you're going to feel convicted to do it. So it's so that focusing on the on who's right here. That's it. Right, is it, really a good point. And I, and I, and I tell them all the time. I said, you know, we evangelize all the time, and especially we as women. If there's a cell at Marshalls. We tell everybody about the cells at Marshalls. I said, you're now witnessing and evangelizing Marshalls. You can take that same mindset and put it over to Jesus Christ and just tell them what you know about Jesus Christ. You don't need to know 500 Bible verses. You just need to know the one that you stand on. And But it, it sounds like right? There's a relationship there first, right? Because I don't tell yes. you about the cell at Marshalls if I don't know you, right? I, so it's, it's, Oh, no, it's, yeah, it's I will. If you're sitting on the bus with me <laughs> <laughs> and you looking down at my feet, you say, oh, I like that shoes. Oh, yeah, I got it at Marshalls. Then now I have a cell. See, that, but that's me. I'll talk to any and everybody, but yeah. 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 No, you're, you're clearly uh, an extrovert. Uh, I think, which is unusual in pastors, I found. I didn't expect it when I came into this role. So many pastors are introverts. Yes, uh, they are. Right. And so you're you're clearly an extrovert. So I can see you talking on the bus about the people about it. And and so, you know, one thing I've been we started having a conversation. I'd love to get your thoughts on. We have conversations that relate to this on our Tuesday calls that we do each week with the Black Ministerial Alliance. But in other areas, I'm having these one on one. And so I'd like I'm starting to bring them into the podcast because I think it's important for folks to hear. You know, over the last 18 months, we as a country have been through an awful lot. Yes, we have. Pandemic, uh, George Floyd and others, uh, protests, vandalism, riots, uh, natural disasters in Haiti, mm -hmm. and flooding in mm -hmm. Europe, the Afghanistan. And, and, and so whenever I talk to pastors, I, I get a very clear sense and consensus of God is doing something. He is. He's doing something with his church. Too. He is. And so the question I started asking, so what do we think that is? What What is he exposing? What are we meant to be learning? What is he doing? How would you think about that? I, I don't know what it is for. I, I really can't give a, a, a specific answer to that. Mm -hmm. But I just know that in the message uh, that he gave me for Sunday with Moses at the, the, the bush, uh, Moses had to turn away from and to look to God. So he had to turn away and look to God. And I say that the, the, the bush was his calling card. And so with us, he's given the church a calling card to take our mind up off of all the distractions, all of the stuff that we used to do in churches, all of how we used to minister, evangelize, prophesy, and all these other things that we used to do. And he's saying, no, I want you to stop that. I want you to turn and look to me and see where I'm trying to direct you to go. Because I think that when we have all of these distractions, we have a hard time hearing God and what he wants us to do in the direction that he wants us to take. Because our minds are so flooded with so many different things. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that when we turn to look to him, he said that we are one body one body, different members. Mm -hmm. So we have all different denominations, 
all, uh, but it's one body. We're all serving Jesus Christ, which means that we all have the same message. And if we all have the same message, we should all be trying to go in the same direction. Well, just yeah. doing it a little different. Yeah, which which there's a beauty in that unity, but your point is something is we don't really have that unity. We don't the church. We don't. And, we do and, not. And so why is that? I, I think that um for me personally, I think that we we as a people in our flesh, yes, we're serving God, yes, we love God. Um, we do want people saved, but we got distracted with all of the um the 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 members and the money and the doing and the and then we forgot the God that was doing the blessing in all of it. And um I, I think it just became a big distraction. We just stopped focusing in on God. And so we all decided to go into our little our little corners. You can go to two blocks in Boston and you'll find five churches and none of them are are are, are fellowshipping with one another. I think that's very sad. And we want to minister the love of Jesus Christ and the unity of him. But yet and still, we don't even talk to each other. Yeah. It's like that, a contradiction. It, it requires work. It does. Right? Because for because you, you're hitting on a really important point, I think, is, is that um, for you and I to have unity, yes. we both have to make sure there's an hour on our calendar every Tuesday Right. And now we're blessed by it. And we like it. So it's not a sacrifice Love it. at all. Yes. Right. But, yes. but it seems like a sacrifice at first of, okay, an hour a week. That's a lot. Right. Yes. A lot. But, yeah. But God blesses that unity. He does. And, but now, just like you're saying, hey, I want to get these, you know, churches together in Brockton, there's everybody has to sacrifice Watch their it. schedule. Right. And it's hard. You know, we're, we're not good. Well, you're making me think two things. One is we're not good at sacrificing. We're selfish, right? All we are. Right? We are selfish people. Right. We've, been, and, we've been spoiled. And I, I was with I was with a pastor yesterday, and I thought they had a really interesting insight. Um, we are discipled by church, depending on what your church tradition is, 20 minutes to 40 minutes or mm -hmm. even more in some cases, a few times a month for most mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Um, we're discipled by the media all day, every all, day. Every day. Time. And and so which discipleship is winning out sometimes? And it's the media. It's the media. And that's about selfishness and taking care of myself and that's it. And partisan politics and right. All this kind of that's stuff. It. So it requires sacrifice. But it doesn't mean that also that because we're not willing to. So we're, we, we're not prone to sacrifice, but that we don't really value unity enough, that we don't appreciate the the, the call for unity in the gospel. Yes. And, and the thing is, is that if we if we realize he said my yoke is easy and my burdens are light mm -hmm. and that if we realize that if we unify with one another. The burden is lighter. Yeah. Yeah. And you're not carrying and sacrificing the whole thing on your own mm -hmm. because you only have a small piece of it because mm -hmm. you're now unified with some others that are going in the same direction that you're going. So it's, it's a good point. Sometimes pastors will complain. They're so isolated and right. It's a unique job and it, it is, there's some hard dynamics of it and stuff like that. But part of what you're saying was don't stop being isolated. <laughs> right? That's it. It, it, it is, it is. And, you know, and, you know, and we all have, you know, I, my church get upset when I start talking about the bag, we all have baggage. We all have that little teeny bag that we carry everywhere we go. So if you have a bag, I have a bag. Let's just open it up and pour it out. You know, let's let's try to be somewhat transparent with one another and stop trying to hide that we we as pastors. I, of course, you can't give that out to everybody. You can't do it to your congregations all the time. But we need to start being transparent, at least with one another and begin to try to work within that with one another. Yeah, you know, I, th I think one of the things I've been I've been noodling on this unity thing for a little while now, and what struck me is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm my background is a lay leader, not a pastor. Yeah, well, you might as well be. I don't know what you're running from, but anyway. <laughs> but, but the, the, the unity we would think about in church was within our church. You have to maintain unity. Right. At the leadership level, though, I think you're hitting on the thing about well, unity has to extend beyond my church. It does. And, and it needs to be across leadership of the church, and right? And what, what I've re what's really struck me in the last year is John 17, 21, 
when Jesus prays, um, when they will be one like you, the father and the son, like you and I are one, mm -hmm. then people will know God sent his son. Yeah. So if we would just be in unity with each other, that's it. Right, it's evangelistic. People will it know is. Jesus just by seeing, and I think it's by seeing, by seeing seeing the unity, right? That's right. If if we could say to the to the world, hey, we've sorted out all the race stuff in the church. We we are, we get along just fine, right? That's we don't it. have. I don't know what you guys are so that's far. That's it, right? I think that would have to be a witness to the world. It but would it, be. It forces us to make the effort to come together and it forces us to sacrifice and it forces me to say, hey, maybe I'm not right about everything, which That's I it. know would shock would shock everyone who knows me, who assumes I'm right about everything. <laughs> <laughs> But but we don't want to do it. It's that's hard work sometimes. And it doesn't seem like we want to prioritize it or, see it or, or really value it. We, we, we don't. We and we have to see, you know, we have to see the 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 individuality of each other and embrace that mm -hmm. and know that because you are this way and I'm this way. The Holy Spirit, when 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 a pastor gets up to preach and they bring the word, everybody in there gets, well, not everybody, but the majority of people get the word, said, you were speaking directly to me. No, it was the Holy Spirit. So just because one person is dealing with one thing, another person is doing dealing with another, the Holy Spirit being uh, God knows what we need. Yeah. So if all of the individual churches, individual leaders and pastors were to come together, the Holy Spirit knows what we need mm -hmm. and that and, and under his guidance, we all can walk as one yeah. still being individual. Yeah, now, I think, you're, you know, I'm thinking I know you experience this as a pastor all the time. Um, but I experienced it not too recently where somebody had asked me to, to share some thoughts on a, on a Zoom call. And I shared it. And after they were done, they were saying, you know, it is, it was, I'm so glad you said this. Yes. It was, it was so impactful. And it's absolutely what needs to be said. And they're going on. It was quite impactful. And I sat there the whole time going, I know I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I know I didn't, but God made sure they heard it. Yes, right? exactly. And exactly. I think you guys experience that more regularly, don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. And, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, you guys on Tuesday when when you're talking, like I said, this you guys are training me uh, more than, you know, um, and I'll hear something and you'll say it one way and the Holy Spirit will give me what you said, but he gives it in the way for me to understand it. Mm -hmm. It may not be the exact word, but it's what he needed me to get out of what you what, what you just said. Mm -hmm. and, and I just I find it so beautiful. I, I really do. I, I just, I, I never, my prayer um, when I, cause back in the day we all used to fellowship together. So our people knew each other and you know, oh, hey, sister so-and-so and how you been, da, 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 da. but only when we used to fellowship together and it was, it was those couple of churches, we've gotten away from that. And so um, I, I feel that when the Holy Spirit speaks He's speaking to each and every one of us for us to begin to come back to that old thing of fellowshipping with one another. And the fellowship doesn't necessarily mean inside that building. Yeah. Do, do you think, because I've heard pastors say this, do you think part of the issue with bringing unity together with the pastors in Brockton, do you think there's a part of it that's like, you're my competition? Yes. Does that turn to it? Well, yeah, I mean, because I mean, just think about the churches. We were just talking about this on Tuesday or Tuesday before where um, it was all about the members and the tithe. You know, if 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 I send that person over to you or, you know, yeah. I don't get my bills paid. Yeah. But then who are you leaning and relying on? Mm -hmm. You know, if the church that you you have is built on God and you're following God, he will make sure that your rent. And, and or your mortgage and anything else that you need. He said, follow me and I will add. He said, I will add, not we add, but he adds. So anyway, that's that's just my that's just my philosophy. And you know, it's, it's a great theological point because it does point, if I'm concerned that you're gonna take my people, then either I wasn't called to this. Right. Right, and God's not gonna give me new people or right. I'm called to this and God's gonna provide. And, even and the bottom line is, they're not your people anyway. 
Yep. They're yep. God's people. I, I, I heard one pastor say too, he said, you're not my competition. No. My competition is apathy, right? 98% <laughs> of people don't go to church anymore. It's apathy. Right. It's Sunday morning sports with kids. Yes. I just yes. want to that's the competition. In, yes. Right. It's right. That's my competition. That's the competition. Really. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you know, and the thing is, you know, you, 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 you meet people and you meet people with the love of God and you're only going to influence those that God has given for you to influence. Mm -hmm. And so it is not about them not liking you, but it is about you trying to figure out how do I get that man to stop washing his car on Sunday and listen to what someone is saying about Jesus Christ or now that things are outside of the church to have his radio on, not tuned to whatever the, the music is, but in tune to some podcasts like vision, new England, uh, or, um, one of the other preachers preaching the word of God, you know, how, how do we reach people that, that is my biggest thing. How do we, reach those with the love of Jesus Christ. That really is the bottom line. Yeah. One, one, uh, I remember one person saying to me a couple of years ago, he said 85% of people won't, won't tell anybody about Jesus this year. Nope. And he said, that just means we don't love them. Yep. And that's pretty convicting. Yes, it right? is. Because I can't come up with a better answer. I said, no, 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 no. It's this, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Because I mean, if you, you know, it's, it's like, <laughs> When you when you first met your wife and you all were dating, your friends and you would be talking, but the only thing you could talk about was this girl you met, mm -hmm. right? Because you were falling in love with her, you know, you were liking everything about her, or and then her with her friends and she was liking everything. That's Jesus Christ. We love him, so therefore, if I love him, he is the topic of my conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't I I don't have to I, I don't need to quote a scripture to you when I meet you, but I do need to show you the love that he has for you yeah. through my and, actions. Yeah. We're, some of us are comfortable about, no, I'm just going to tell you about Jesus, but I don't have time to love you. Right? Yeah. And, I, and, and, and if you don't accept right now, I got to move on. I got things to do. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and the other thing we have to stop doing is we have to stop thinking that because we are talking to people initially that we initially have to get them to give their life to Christ. You know, let the Holy Spirit do the Holy Spirit. Let God be God, the Lord be Lord, and the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. And you stay in the lane of where he's put you to do what you got to do. Yeah. So year, years ago, it seemed, but we lived in such a different culture years ago, right? I, You shared Jesus with me. I recognize the authority of God, the authority of scripture. And now that you've opened it up to me, I could, I, I'm like, okay, I'm on board. I, I surrender to Jesus. Now we're, we're finding that people might need like 13 touches by Jesus before they yes. give their lives to him. And so you may just be one of those touches along the way. That's and it. That's, I, that's I, tell, I, I, tell my, I tell my church all the time. I said, we're either planting a seed or we're watering a seed. I said, that's mm -hmm. all we're doing. God is going to give the increase. Whether that person comes to lively stones or not, it doesn't matter. As long as you watered or planted. Because mm -hmm. if and you don't water it, it's not growing. If you don't plant anything, there's nothing there. Yeah. So we have to get, we have to be willing to give a little bit of ourselves. I have one uh, young lady in my church. Uh, we used to work together and um, I talked to her for two years, two years about Jesus Christ yeah. and not even saying Jesus Christ. It, well, yeah, I did, but it's like, she was saying, I, 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 um, I want to get a car. And then I would tell her about how Jesus blessed me with a car and no money. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. those kind of things, we have to be willing to share and stop hiding our stuff is what I call it yeah. because we all got stuff. And my, my former pastor used to say, we're all exes of something. And mm -hmm. exes doesn't necessarily mean that it's a drug addiction or alcoholism. You're ex something because we're all sinners saved by grace. Yeah. And I think the patience, you're, you're making a really good point on patience. You're reminding me, we've got friends where the wife prayed for her husband to meet Jesus for 30 years. Hello. And he did. Yes. 
30 years, right? I'm not sure too many of us, you know, I'll pray for you for a month, but once the month is up, come on, I gotta, I'll move it on. I you know, get- <laughs> or we tell people, you know, if you, if you need something or, or, you know, you need to talk, call me. Okay. So now you just sat down at the dinner table and they're calling you and you ignore the call. And I find that to ignore that call is worse than anything in the world because you told them, if you need me, call me. And to say that you have to be honest behind it. So your food is not more important than the soul that's in balance, right? Yeah, Yeah. that's, you know, I keep going back to lately this, this sacrificial love. Yeah. Jesus, right? So we're called to sacrifice the same way. And it, it seemed where well, we were saying this, I call it seems like reading the church bulletin sounds seems like a pretty small sacrifice, but many of us aren't doing it. Right. <laughs> but having a cold dinner one night is not the biggest sacrifice in the world. There's people doing much harder things than that. That's it. You got yeah. somebody's life in balance. You know, yeah. I, you know, we just need to I, 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 I'm back to it again. We really do truly just need to show the love of Jesus Christ and don't commit to things that you you know that you're not going to do. Don't tell me to call you if I need you. I mean, yes, you're going to have people that want to pull, pull, pull. And, you know, even the Bible talks about them too. stop, you know you know, that want to pull, 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 pull. But if you're guided by the Holy Spirit, he'll give you the words to say, and he'll let you know when to cut that loose. But you are not the one to decide to cut it loose because your dinner is waiting or you have a a, a date that you plan to go on or or whatever our, our little menial things are that we think are so important. You know, I I find now that, you know, with the cell phones, everybody is so super important that we can't come up out of our phone, you know, to even say, you know, you're walking down the hallway, you go, good morning. You don't, you didn't look at the person's face. You don't know who you spoke to. And so my thing was always to say, good morning. How are you? And to wait for a reply. Yeah. And I've been able, I was able to witness at the hospital to more people just by waiting on a reply and the Holy Spirit showing me their face. I said, oh, are you all right today? And I don't care whether it was cleaning the floor or dumping the trash. It didn't matter to me. You know, and that's what we have to do. We don't see each other anymore. We have neighbors that we don't even speak to. Yeah, we we uh, I forget who was saying this. I always I, I, I listen to and watch so many things. I never remember where I get it from. I just remember the takeaway. Yeah. And the, the key takeaway was we say we love people. And if I were to say to you, well, prove to me you love your daughter. Mm-hmm. Right. You're going to point to sacrifices. Yes. Right. I was, yeah. I was sharing this on a Sunday. School That's class good, Charles. That is really good. Right. And so if you say, prove to me you love your kids. I'm like, I paid for college for two kids. Guess how many other kids in the world I'm planning to do that for? (laughs) (laughs) And and, and I tease my wife all the time. I say, I bought you a house. How could I not love you? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. But it's it's actions and sacrifices. And sometimes we say we love our neighbors. And one person said one time, what's their first names? Exactly. What's the first name? I was just, well, you know, I'm, I'm into, I, I love sci-fi movies. And um, I was just um, watching one and the, 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 the leader was surprised that the, the, the lower person would be willing to kill him. And he asked him, he said, why would you turn against me? He said, what's my name? And so he gave him his rank and his last name. And he said, and I've known you for six years. He said, what is my first name? Mm -hmm. He said, the first time I met the other person, they asked me my name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting point, right? There's a a ministry that focuses on just the, the, they call it the art of neighboring, right? It's just like, you know, Go if you can't tell me the first names of your neighbors and something about them that you don't get from them driving out of their driveway waving to you, <laughs> right? then you don't love your neighbor. That's and true. They're, they're your physical neighbors, right? You're not the, the 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 good Samaritan or anything. They're their physical neighbors. And, that's it. And I think a lot of us don't do that. We've tried to get we better. Don't. We don't. And I, you know, and even in the in in the neighbor the the neighborhood. I mean, we got new people moving in. And I need to take the time to go and introduce myself, 
to them, uh, whether we become friends or, or talk every day or what, I still need to take the initiative to go and do that. Yeah. You know, uh, that takes a sacrifice. And, you know, when we're sacrificing for people, it is not always uh, that they're looking for money or materialistic things. Sometimes somebody just need a kind word or a hug or to, to say, I see you. I see you. You matter. That's great. That's great. So so let's let's shift gears a little bit. So what have you seen? So just one as you think back on the last few years, what's a cool thing you've seen God do? I've seen God take um COVID has been bad. Mm. Yes. Yeah. But the cool thing that I've seen is sitting on the Black Ministerial Alliance with learned people. Uh, learned people that began to share with one another. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't matter whether your church was large or small. It didn't matter whether you had a degree or no degree. It didn't matter whether you was black or white. It was just a sharing. And that would not have been possible if not for COVID. It's a great point. It's a great point because we would we would meet every month before COVID. So right away, you're fewer. And then the, you don't get the same people coming every time. Mm -hmm. and so it really has been a core group. And it's, it's just blessed and ministered to me. And I know you've shared the same thing. Yes. So as other so have other people. And that that has been a neat thing. I agree with you. COVID's bad. That's a neat thing that God has right. done. But again, because you know you, we're talking about unifying churches, and I and 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 you know, and I say that, but I I feel that uh, our our Tuesday mornings pastors are actually coming together, and it's different denominations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different location. Different right? locations. Right. Yes. But that's I, I keep I I think about unity as you know I know you. It has to start with that. I know you and your first mm -hmm. name. To your point, I know you, mm -hmm. and I pray for you, and I care yes. about you, and I support you. And when yeah. we agree on everything, it never comes up. Hey, do you agree on this and that? And are you a five point? Or right? we just talk, right? Yes, we just talk. Yeah, we just talk. Yes, right. Now that's a good one. That's a good one. Where is an area that you would say my theology has evolved on this? I used to think of it this way. Today, I think about it a little bit different. Would you point to anything? Uh, <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, but. Um, I'm growing in ways that surprise me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's um, you know like when when you think about shacking, you know, it's against the Bible. Mm -hmm. And someone pointed out to me that yes, they may be shacking, but if you come in with the love of God and begin to minister, at least the father is still in the home. The mother is still there. And now you get the opportunity to share with them what Jesus Christ want instead of saying, oh, you're shacking. You, you got a man laying up in your house and you're not married to them. Where's the love of Jesus Christ? And how can you unify that and, 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 and begin to show them that they are bonded and that they need to be bonded? You have made a child. You all need to be bonded. So that's I, I'm evolving in, in ways of looking at. Uh, things that used to be drilled down to me as a child in church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. It's a kind of the practice of our faith is evolving. That's neat. The so we have some uh, lightning round questions we call them. So they're just quick ones at the end for folks to get to know you a little bit better. And so, what's your favorite verse? I have uh, well, I had to write them down because I had that's to sit in and delete some. <laughs> 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 so. Um, Philippians 1, 18, 24, I've been standing on and it's been my voicemail since 1988. Okay. 1988 is when I gave my life to Christ. I was broke, poor, didn't know how to feed my child. And, and the verse came to me and it said, this is the day that the Lord has made rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know anybody else's interpretation of it, but my interpretation of it is, is that even though you're going through, even though it, it seems bad, even though you don't know what tomorrow may hold, rejoice in me today because I made this day for you, which means I still have another chance to try to get it right. Amen. Oh, that one. And then uh, Philippians 4.11, um, 
you know, to learn to be content in everything. Because contentment to me doesn't mean that I am standing still. It means that right now I need to be content in what God is providing for me in this moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's my other one. Two, two great ones. Who's your favorite hero or heroine in the Bible? So, uh, <laughs> and I know people go, why do you always, I'd love Jonah. What? So say a little bit more. Why about, Why Jonah? I love Jonah for the simple fact is that Jonah, even though he hated the people, he mm -hmm. hated them for what he had, what they had already done to his people. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were still God's people. But Jonah wasn't afraid to speak to God, even though he ended up in the end whining still and not. But yeah. but Jonah wasn't afraid to say, God, this is how I feel. Yeah. This is why I'm feeling what I feel. And so to me, when I, you know, Jonah's always spoke to me in that way to be able to be honest with God because he knows everything anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Because the end of that is right. I knew you weren't going to kill him. I, this is why I didn't want to come here because I knew you wouldn't kill him. <laughs> because he just, he, he talks to God. He yeah. talks to, he, not, not in a disrespectful way, but he, he's just not trying to hide who he is. Yeah. yeah. So that's why Jonah speaks to me. And of course, the silly part is like we could hide it. Right. You you can't anyway, <laughs> but we do. We all try. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's a great. We point. all try. We and all so try. who's a hero not in the Bible? Uh, I thought about that one hard. And my hero not in the Bible is my mother. Mm -hmm. um, my mother. My mother committed suicide when I was 15 years old um, because she she felt that she had nothing to give her children, but she gave us everything. I didn't even realize I was poor. You know, when we didn't have um, when when our lights would go off because she couldn't pay for them. I didn't understand that she would lay out a blanket and she would get food and we she would set the candles around and she said we're gonna have a candlelight dinner that was my mom and so that's how i've learned how to even do deal with some of the the things that i have faced you know so she's my hero that's my hero you, you have her optimism <laughs> I, I can tell. I can tell. that's and my so, mom. So what, what book are you reading now besides the Bible? And so my thing is, and at last, as I explained to you all the other day, I've been so busy uh, the last few years uh, uh, of trying to maintain and to figure out how to pastor that mm -hmm. I haven't taken time to even begin to read. I got books all around me. So no, I, I do devotionals, <laughs> I do the Bible. And, yeah. uh, but uh, I realized in, um, God has had me in a place since the middle of July that I realized that I have to take the time to focus in on some other things. Cause sometimes for me, I, I don't retain all scriptures, but if I can get it like, um, I, I like sci-fi-ish kind of things. So I used to love Frank Peretti, you know, uh, Pierce in the Darkness. And so I, I like those kind of things that are Bible based, but okay. fictional. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so favorite movie? <sighs> what did I put down? Um, <laughs> the Avatar. <laughs> Okay. Avatar and Green Mile. I don't ask me why. I, I <laughs> love those two movies. Love them. Okay. love them. I'm not a really a movie movie goer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm an old movie person. So I've heard of those, but I don't know anything about them to know whether I'd agree <laughs> or disagree. <laughs> and what about a favorite song or hymn? So my favorite songs right now, because they shift all the time. So my favorite song is um the one by Evie McKenna. And it says, ain't that just like God? And um, Tasha Cobbs, he knows my name because it ministers to me to know that, you know, me. Anyway, he knows my name. Uh, Karen Hawthorne, uh, he still loves me. And anything by commissioned. And that group is no longer. So I, I yes. OK, cool, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for uh, thank, having me. Thank you for your ministry. 
Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your contagious enthusiasm and energy. I really appreciate it. Blesses us every Tuesday morning. I know it blesses me. I know it blesses the group. So I'm really grateful to you for it. Thank you so much, Charles. I, I really appreciate this. And um, thank you for get, getting me calmed down. I, I, you know, thank you. And thank our audience. Thank you uh, for being with us. I hope you've loved meeting Pastor Cindy as much as I have and that, there, that God spoke to you through her. Um, and you hear whatever it is you need to hear in that. Uh, and so, uh, so thank you. I'd like to thank our producer, Ashley Pitkin, uh, who puts thank this you, all Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> and, uh, and I'd like to thank our sponsor. We now have a sponsor for a podcast, the Luis Palau Association, who's dedicated to proclaiming the good news, uniting the church, and impacting uh, the, the cities worldwide. And so if you were blessed by this, please like it, share it, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, or you can get more information on visionnewengland.org. Next week, we'll have Dr. Ray Hammond with us and uh, Pastor Enoch Lau. Um, and we're planning to talk about evangelism, but we might call an audible or sorry, talk about Afghanistan. And we might call an audible and talk about exactly what Pastor Cindy and I were leading into today. This whole thing about what is God doing in COVID? So yeah. we're supposed to do one. I'm going to ask him if they want to do another. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but thank you again, Pastor Cindy, for being with us. Thank you, Charles. And thank you to all your sponsors and anybody you're looking. And I hope um, that you what you see in me is the love that I have for Jesus Christ. I do. I do. Thank you. And God bless you. See you next God time. God bless you as well. Bye-bye.